Do we need to do some... We totally do. So you're going to do a little like a, a dance to the AV purple. magic yeah. for a second. Yeah. Uh, one of the ways, uh, so let me cover two things right off the back. I, I did purchase a bottle of water tonight, so you can silently judge me. Right? This is like the worst crowd in the world to actually have a bottle. Like a, no one thinks that's funny. That's uh, the other thing I'm, I'm um, nervous about is like stylish people right now, uh, stylish young people, are rolling their sleeves past the elbow. Is, it, is anybody aware of this phenomenon, right? Like, if you look, if I walk through Gastown, all the young men have their sleeves rolled. And I tried that earlier, and it just was uncomfortable to me. Because I'm in kind of a West Wing, past halfway up the, the wrist is what I've got going on here. Um, so, that's, sorry, those are, those are the two things I can think to talk about before this happens. Um, so, uh, because I have an Apple uh, device, an Apple remote control, it has a range of about six inches. So, Eli, uh, and along with his many other duties, is going to advance my slide. So you can go ahead and hit the space bar there and advance so it. So good thing. Um, is that really the first slide? <laughs> no, no, this is. Um, yeah, okay, fine, that's fine. Uh, yeah, so go ahead, slide. Uh, briefly, I uh, am the co-founder of an organization called Capulet. We do web marketing and strategy, mostly in the nonprofit space, also in the technology space. Uh, lately, we have been slide. Oh, Eli. I need you to focus here. <laughs> focus all your ginger power. Um, okay, we do a lot of work right now in partnership with Biro Creative, which is an organization in town who does like branding and design work. Uh, these are some of our clients right now. Uh, that little uptick means you should slide. Um, these are some of our clients. Uh, we, we work with some of our nonprofit organizations around the world. And uh, slide. And uh, because I have your attention, I'm doing an odd project this year called One Year One Canadian, where I only consume Canadian food, wow. Canadian products, Canadian media services. You can learn more about that by Googling One Year One Canadian or go to one, the number Y, one C.ca. I'm going to talk fast and slides will be available afterwards. You can ask questions at any time. I reserve the right to defer a question. Questions are uh, short, specific, and end with a question mark. Okay, um, so this weekend I was on Keats Island, and I was blackberry picking, and as you may be able to tell by my pallor and my delicate, uncalloused hands, I'm a city boy, so I'm unaccustomed to picking blackberries. And so, uh, no, sorry, go back. I'll just say slide, just to be clear. Yeah. Um, so I, I, got, I went up the stepladder, and I was um, picking away and picking away, and then, um, you know, I was doing okay, but then I got down off the stepladder, slide, uh, and then I looked up. Right? And from that lower perspective of standing on the ground looking up, um, I saw so many more berries behind leaves, under leaves, from, um, all, from an entirely different perspective slide. My resolve has changed and I got a whole bunch of blackberries, like a pound and a half. Welcome. Come on in. Um, and so that's my hope for you tonight. My hope is to just like consider, uh, just help you consider changing your perspective a little, right? If things go well. Uh, if things go poorly, blackberries for everyone. No, I, I, I did not bring any blackberries. Because I'm living Canadian, I need to like collect all my food and freeze it this time of year for the fall run, because so many food. no berries. Uh, slide, please. So this is a photo of the Baltic Way. In uh, 1989, the countries of Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia got together, organized 2 million people, 25% of their collective 8 million person um, population, and, well, come on up. Um, an 8 million person population into a human chain that connected the three capital cities. They held hands across the three countries, the three capital cities of Vilnius, Riga, and who knows the capital city of Estonia? Oh. Wow, very good. Who said that? That was you? Very good. Are you perhaps Estonian? But you were there. That's awesome, because I was concerned no one would know the answer to that question. Um, so it's a remarkable thing. It happened in 1989 before the internet, more or less. Um, and so I just want to start with that lesson that, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about the influence of Facebook and, and uh, Twitter on, on the Arab Spring, on what happened in Egypt and so forth. But, like, people may change and organize and protest it and change the world long before the Internet, right? So this is a remarkable occurrence, and that's, I'll come to, back to that theme again and again. Slide. Okay, so let's start with the problem. Uh, the problem is this. In marketing communications for nonprofits, everyone is doing the same thing. Okay, they're doing um, email communications. They're doing social media. They're doing online advertising. Your, we, we are doing, um, you know, variety of other search engine optimization. Um, all these things. People are all doing the same thing. Uh, how do we have evidence of that? Slide. 
Uh, Facebook ads. I don't know if anybody's been buying Facebook ads over the past couple of years and see the ridiculous increase in price, but this is indi in indicative of um, lots of demand for this service, right? Lots of people are doing this. Um, if, you've, if you're in marketing communications, whether it's for-profit or non-profit, you're familiar with this idea. Line goes down, bad news. This is uh, email open rates for the period of, uh, for the nonprofit sector for 2007 through 2009. This line always goes down, right? The um, people are saturated with email. They get more and more email. Um, they open fewer and fewer of them, right? Um, so the scenario here is that if, if everybody is doing the same thing, even if you are really good at doing these things, even if you are superb at email marketing, and you kill at search engine optimization, and you write the best Facebook ads, you're only going to win by a little, right? Um, you're only going to win by a tiny, tiny bit. And so what I'm going to talk to you over the next, I don't know, 40, 35, 40 minutes about is how to win occasionally by a significant amount, right? How to do that, that baseline stuff well, but how to think about your strategy, think about your communications marketing strategy in a way that enables you to occasionally win by a lot, right? Um, I was going to go with a sports metaphor, which always gets used here. Well, the, the most common sports metaphor in talks is uh, skate to where the puck is, uh, is going, not where it is. You hear that all the time, Wayne Gretzky. The second one is the Fosbury flop. Dick Fosbury, this high jumper, invented the backwards high jump, like before, before um, I think this is in the 80s or the 60s, I don't know. Um, uh, historically, people jumped forward with their head first over the bar or they scissored over the bar, right? But Dick Fosbury came along and he said, hey, if I jump uh, backwards with my head, the back of my head leading with that, um, it'll be transformative, and it was. It's like the slap shot in hockey or anything. But we want to win by a lot, occasionally. This is the deal. So we have a strategy that uh, is broken into two big buckets of stuff, two big kinds of activities that we undertake in an ongoing, um, ongoing marketing activities, ongoing campaigns. They are heartbeats and remarkables. Slide, please. Let's first talk about heartbeats. Almost cut off there. Okay, heartbeat activities, go ahead, slide. Um, this is ordinary stuff you do all the time, ongoing. You may do it focused on um, particular marketing campaigns, issues, etc. But it's just like baseline heartbeat stuff. Bum, 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 right? Oh, you, you blog, you create stuff for your website. You um, do search engine optimization, you do email marketing, you do press releases, you do social media updates, online advertising. This is just a you know, hodgepodge of stuff, a, a, a grab bag, if you like. There are plenty of others you could pick from as well. Um, but this is, you may do offline stuff as well. You do, do, may do mail outs, you know, calls for donation, this sort of thing. Um, but it's baseline stuff, right? And to go back to my premise, you can do this, if you do this stuff really, really well, you'll be like best in the industry and have impressive numbers to show. But you're only going to be your competition by a little. Um, why do we do this kind of stuff? Yep. Um, we do this kind of stuff, you know, to connect with your existing community, right? Um, to, to get people to do things, calls for action, to raise money, to maybe you want to shine a light on existing members. And this is important. I don't want to undervalue this stuff. You need to learn how to do this. Um, this bucket of heartbeat activities well and do it on an ongoing basis because it's kind of the lifeblood of your organization and we see it as the way you connect with your existing membership. Slide, please. Um, how many people know what I mean when I say the engagement ladder or the engagement circles? Hands up. Okay, some of you. Uh, you're going to be bored in the next two minutes. I apologize for that. Um, this is a philosophy that I first learned from an odd place, uh, a book by Rick Warren, the evangelical founder of uh, Saddleback Church. Um, and he has a great book. It's full of Jesus. You can give or take that. It's not a judgment, but just a warning. A great book called The Purpose Driven Church, which is exactly about all this stuff, about winning offline and online, um, evangelizing, building a community, and so, far, so forth. And a key aspect of um, his philosophy, and this is increasingly commonplace in the nonprofit sector, is you have all these kind of different groups, right? And um, they go from least engaged to most engaged. And you have the most number of people are in the big circle, and they get smaller, smaller number of people. So um, they go from community to core. And much of the philosophy we're talking about now, I'm, I'm talking about tonight, is about um, creating a bigger funnel of people, of community, right? The outer layer, getting more people in there, and then increasing their engagement. Because you want people to move inward to the center here, right? Or up the ladder. Um, so if we think about uh, this organization, 
uh, next Tuesday in Vancouver. Um, let's imagine Eli is staff, but the volunteers who support Eli are in the core, right? They're the, 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 the true core people. Committed people might be people who have come a lot, right? And maybe they volunteered in the past or something like that. And all the way out here to community, and we think of community as like your prospects, right? Not people who are present here, but people who are here for the first time might be proud, but um, prospects. So um, everybody in the nonprofit sector in Vancouver is maybe part of the community, um, and so on and so, so forth. So um, when we think of our heartbeat activities, we actually think, first, the heartbeat activities are not kind of for recruitment or bringing more people into this sort of funnel, but instead it's for the existing people, right? It's about communicating and engaging with them, and maybe also uh, about empowering them to do things on their own, to organize events, and so on and so forth. For example, if Eli wasn't here, he might empower some of his core to organize uh, next month's event all by themselves, right? And he can do that because he's got a core. If there's nobody in the middle of this circle, right, he's all by himself. Um, slide, please. So, those are the heartbeat activities, and you want to do those on an ongoing basis. And, and you know, they're, you know, you can go read books and attend workshops and all sorts of different ways to learn how to write better web content, um, do better um, sock med, we call it sock med, capital, social media stuff, um, how to uh, do SEO, all those kind of core activities, how to write great sales letters to ask people for donations, uh, all that stuff. And that's important, um, but then you need to pair that activity with remarkable things. Uh, slide, please. Uh, Seth Godin is our favorite marketing guru. Uh, I recommend all of his books. I would start with the book kind of referenced in the previous slide called The Purple Cow. I wrote a business book, and I hate business books, but The Purple Cow is short and very readable. It's very thin. Uh, and he says safe is risky, and risky is safe. And uh, if you take one thing away from this talk, take that away, right? Um, we've seen this proven again and again and again successful, right? If you only do ordinary things, you are at risk of being overcome all the time. So you need to take risks, and um, you need to throw stuff against the wall. And sometimes that stuff will, will stick and be awesome, and sometimes it will fail miserably. And in my experience, particularly in the nonprofit sector, this is a scary idea for people because resources are restricted, and um, you know there's uh, organizational paradigms, and we're very conservative on some of these things, right? But um, the way to succeed in this space is to take risks and be risky. And uh, what we call remarkables are the way we advise people and the way we do that. Slide, please. So, what are remarkables? Um, remarkables are things are uh, mostly online, though I'm going to show you examples both off and online, which are um, literally remarkable, worthy of being remarked upon, which is the kind of fundamental idea behind word of mouth, right? Or buzz, if you want yet another catchphrase. Um, they are, I'm just going to show you some examples, because they can be all sorts of things. They can be microsites, they can be clever campaigns inside a social media channel, they can be online slash offline activities, um, but their objectives are a little different from the heartbeat activities. There's some overlap, um, but really one of the fundamental reasons we do remarkable activities is to recruit new members, right? To spread the word, to get attention, maybe in the media, maybe kind of grassroots attention. Um, we want to inspire actions and activities. We want to connect with influencers, right? This is something we've done a long time in the online space. We want people with broad influence, broad reach, uh, whether those are online journalists or popular bloggers, to write about us. Um, we want to tell stories. We want to increase the amount of attention we get. We kind of generally improve our web presence. So we, again, have a kind of bigger sales funnel, bigger uh, um, circle of community when we uh, hit them with the kind of heartbeat communications, the heartbeat activities. So it's like. Uh, now I want to tell you about some examples. Does anybody know uh, about, has anybody seen this website? It's called A New Warrior. It was Greenpeace's fundraising, fundraising effort for their new version, version 3.0 of the Rainbow Warrior. A new a Rainbow Warrior 3, right? Anybody seen this? This is an extraordinary website. If you Google A New Warrior, you'll see it. Um, we had nothing to do with this project, by the way. We just love it. And um, in this project, uh, they had a, if you visit the site, you'll first see, uh, I'm not going to show you the video because we're short on time, but like this beautiful, compelling video kind of giving you this brief history of the Rainbow Warrior boat. Ship? Boat? Ship, thank you. Uh, the Rainbow Warrior ship. And then you um, kind of get transported into this page, um, which uh, invites you to donate. And the page uh, shows all sorts of fascinating things about the live construction of the boat, but the really fascinating boat, 
part, the fantastic part, is you can dive into these blueprints of each level of the ship, and it's all beautifully, gracefully done. Dive into blueprints uh, on the ship and make a donation in the form of buying a thing on the ship. So you can like buy a wrench for like eight euro, it was a Euro European center project, up to like buying a mask that costs a thousand euro or something, right? So this very kind of concrete connection between your donation what happened. But what to me was so remarkable was how um, beautifully and artfully it was actually presented, right? Uh, fundamentally, it's just a donation campaign, right? But um, your experience of it was like, uh, to my mind, kind of transformative. And it was hard, you know, we immediately bought a wrench or something small, I forget what we bought, or a toilet or something like that. A, a head, I suppose, if you're on a boat. Um, but it was a terrific example of like something, and I immediately shared it, right? Share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter, send it to some colleagues, said, this is amazing, right? And unquestionably, it cost a lot of money to design this site. This is not like out of the box anything. It is probably a $100,000 site, right? But I don't know how much money, I should uh, know how much money they were trying to raise, but it was significantly greater than that. But it was a risk. They spent significant investment to build this thing, and um, if nobody had bought it, well, this would be a, this number would be sad. The Rainbow Warrior, by the way, is complete now, and I think it's coming to Vancouver later this month. I think on the 14th, if you want to go visit it. Is, some, is anybody nodding? Does anybody know the details of that? You are? The 14th? Yeah. 17th, 18th. 17th, 18th. Okay, so if you want to see the new uh, Rainbow Warrior, just Google Rainbow Warrior Vancouver 2011 something something, uh, and you'll find it. I think it's coming to Jericho. So anyway, a remarkable fundraising campaign, right? Not ordinary, just not a boring ass old page, but something quite remarkable. Uh, slide, please. Uh, now we're going to play the video. That's, um, so, oh, no, sorry, yeah. No, the internet, I, yeah. I, I can do this, I can do this. Yeah. I'm work in technology. Sound, perfect. Sound? Maybe. Sound, yeah. Uh, he said it was going to blow the room out. Of yeah. yeah. Okay, you want to, you want to turn it back down? Uh, pause that a bit. All right, well. We it's not essential, let's just play it silently and that's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Here. That's fine. We'll just, I'll just show it to you. you. You've all, I'm sure, seen the old Spice Man here. He's, he's yeah. actually in the sidecar here. The old Spice video, right? Which got about 35 million views. Um, this is a kind of takeoff, a riff, if you like, on that video. Um, this is a guy at a Brigham Young University. Um, you can keep playing it. Um, a guy at Brigham Young University doing um, a kind of takeoff on that old Spice Man video. And it is really slick. It was produced by students on campus. Um, and it's an ad for the library at Brigham Young University, right? It is, a, it is in fact, so this is um, kind of an institutional thing. He gets a sandwich there, and he says, ah, I'm on a horse. No, he says, I'm on a cart, right? Yeah. Anyway, it's, it's a terrific little video. This is an ad for a university a library, and it's had 2.8 million views, right? Truly a remarkable video. Truly um, a striking, thank you. Um, uh, truly a striking thing. Not, a, a not, Ordinary, like you can imagine if the uh, university went with its usual um, ad agency to produce, oh, we need to advertise our library, and you get a pretty staid, possibly pretty boring um, ad. But instead they got this kind of remarkable riff on something the web loves. And in fact, when we're building Remarkables, this is one way in which we um, devise remarkable things, remarkable things to talk about, um, remarkable concepts. We riff on what the web already loves, right? And the web loves this, right? You, you couldn't be on the internet six or eight months ago without seeing the, was it last year already? Uh, last year, without seeing the old Spice Guy video and seeing all the kind of stuff that fell out of that and all the other satires and things that took off on it, right? Um, so um, a lot of our activities, I think I'll I have an example later, Say we say, what does the web love right now? Uh, does the web love infographics right now? Does the web love, um, you know, funny pictures of cats? Well, the web's always loved that, right? But, uh, uh, so on and so forth, right? But another, again, a remarkable thing. Risky, for sure. Slide. Uh, this is a campaign we did. We, in the summer of 2010, uh, we do a project, uh, ongoing project, with thebigwild.org, which is a, kind of the conservation arm of Mountain Equipment Co-op. And um, uh, in, in mid-2010, these things called QR codes were really taken off. How many people in the room have actually scanned a QR code? Okay, some of you, uh, a lot of you, right? Yeah. 
I, you can think of these as uh, more information buttons in the real world. That's what I call them. You scan these with your phone, and it can pop up a website or a phone number or a text message or something. And um, so what we did is um, we wanted to, we kind of had a mandate to raise awareness for the big wild across the country and get some mainstream media attention. Like that was our objective. And so um, what we did is we produced these posters um, and they say, do something small to save something big. And we kind of had them postered guerrilla style. We just hired local poster guys in seven Canadian cities. And they're kind of, there's no branding and they're just a big QR code. Right, and uh, this is kind of slogan, so you don't even know it's from Mount Puma Co-op or the Big Wild. But when you scan it, you come to um, this little, a very simple web page that is a call to action to sign a petition. And we had different posters for different regions that correlated to different um, wilderness areas that we wanted to protect, right? We did not care if anybody scanned this poster. We did not care at all. Because the objective was mainstream media attention, right? The objective was, how can we talk to the media in an original way about um, the big wild and about conservation, right? Without actually telling conservation stories, because we partner with CPAWS and other organizations, so we're not really conservation experts. We're kind of this weird middle man. Um, we think of ourselves as an amplifier in this context. Um, but we get, um, slide, I think. Yeah, we got a bunch of media attention around this, and uh, because we sold the angle of like, hey, conservation organization using new technology, right? And that enabled, um, the journalists to talk about QR codes and how they're on Big Mac wrappers in Japan and how they're there's, you know increasing applications for them in all these sectors and it made them like uh, hey we're talking about a hot new trend but we managed to get our kind of conservation campaign along for the ride right and so this was not without risk it cost money to get posters designed it cost money to get them pasted up around uh, seven cities. Um, we might have had backlash for people like, you're a conservation campaign and you're producing a bunch of paper and putting it on walls? That's not great. We didn't, we didn't get that, but, um, but that was a legitimate concern. And then there's the, the biggest risk is that no one would cover it at all. No mainstream media would cover it at all. We would just spent a bunch of money for no reason. But um, it paid good dividends and we were really happy with the outcome. And this is an example of connecting something offline with something online. In a very literal sense, there are plenty of examples that are more subtle than this one. Um, but again, um, doing something remarkable, out of, out of the ordinary. And what's interesting actually for the Big Wild is how much coverage this has gotten um, accidentally over the past year from like blogs and newspapers and online whatever, online news sites that write about QR codes and they Google and search and they discover this odd conservation campaign and this included in a roundup of interesting uh, QR code based campaigns. So we get a lot of um, kind of long tail traffic and long tail attention from doing something remarkable. Which is why it's important, as a footnote for, for marketing purposes, to always keep your thing up, right? Um, people create campaigns like uh, that, a new warrior from Greenpeace, and once the campaign's finished, it goes away. But they've built up all this attention around it, all this link juice, all this attention. Um, and if they don't kind of handle the kind of end of life of that campaign and manage that traffic that keeps coming to them um, and say, oh, this campaign's over, but you might be interested in this thing. But this campaign's over, but, and here's um, some live footage of the new ship entering the water and so on and so forth, then uh, you lose a kind of long tail of all that traffic. That's just an aside. Yes? So having created the attention around the ship, mm -hmm. We'd all want to follow the bouncing ball, which is the sequence of voyages, like we used to watch mm -hmm. Jacques Cousteau, for yep. example. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, you said uh, we want to follow the story of the ship and, and what's going on. So even if I didn't actually look, but you hope, for example, for people who don't donate, right? If you donate, you immediately jump several rungs in that ladder in those circles, I think. But um, maybe you just like say follow us on Facebook or sign up for our email newsletter, so you get them in the funnel, at least, so you can connect with them, and then tell them stories of the ship being built, and tell them stories of where the ship goes, and um, so on and so forth. And then so the kind of heartbeat activities, the remarkable brings them in of this remarkable fundraising page, and then the heartbeat keeps them going and hopefully increases their engagement. So is the heartbeat that takes them up the ladder? Yeah, in theory, the heartbeat takes them up the ladder, right? So, so maybe they just sign up, maybe they don't donate, but they sign up in your email newsletter, then you tell them stories for six months about the ship and about what it's doing and its important work, and then they say, oh, Christmas is coming up, I'm going to make a donation or make a gift to my mother as a, of a donation. Um, and so then that moves them up the ladder, right? And, um, you know, the tools, the online tools are getting increasingly sophisticated to, like, 
um, track. We sometimes now work with tools that actually um, identify every single member of the community in these terms, right? Are they a member, are they a core, are they committed, are they part of the community? And we have like uh, hooks in our online tools to say, okay, this person donated, that means they jump up and they get a new name. And, and uh, usually we don't surface that to the user, but some tools even surface that to the user. So you can say, um, oh, look right now, um, Greenpeace did an interesting campaign around Star Wars and um, the, uh, what was the Star Wars and the... Uh, the Dark Side? Yeah, the Dark Side. What was the target? Volkswagen. Volkswagen, yes. <laughs> Volkswagen, what a nice brand. But uh, they use this like Star Wars meme to go after Volkswagen for reasons I've forgotten, um, but the, the way they did it was super cool, and you kind of leveled up as a Star Wars character. Because um, Volkswagen had used Star Wars in their own advertising, and so they were kind of rolling that back. And this is this way to like actually surface some of these progress up the engagement ladder, because once you shared it with five people, you went from an Ewok to like a Stormtrooper, I don't know, but this is super cool. Sorry? Okay. Uh, onward. So, how do you make it remarkable? There's lots and lots of ways, lots and lots of ways. I don't, uh, you know, it's a whole day just to talk, talk through the process, but these are a few things, some of which I've already mentioned, that we like to do. Go ahead. So, change the medium of the message. Um, some years ago, we, we, were, we did our only ever, go ahead, uh, real estate project, uh, which was with a luxury resort in the Caribbean. And they were kind of yachting focused and this sort of thing. And, and uh, so, we wanted to get coverage on a bunch of, from a bunch of online journalists and bloggers who wrote about luxury resorts and yachts and this sort of thing. And please don't let that put you off. It is applicable in any kind of sector to any kind of story. And so, um, you know, people get a lot of email, right? Like, I'm sure everybody in this room gets 20, 50, 100 emails a day. But um, you don't get that much actual mail, and you probably, in a given week, get very few coconuts, right? <laughs> so the, um, we learned, I happen to know, thanks to Gilligan's Island, I believe, no love boat or something. Um, I happen to know that you can actually just send a coconut in the mail, just like that, in the uh, continental, not even the continental, because it's Hawaii's fault, so uh, in the United States, you can send a coconut, right? So we um, had somebody, not across international borders, so we had somebody in the U.S., just, um, we made a bunch of um, customized landing pages. I've taken, oh yeah, the landing page is here at the bottom. And we just slapped a, lo a label on some coconuts and sent it to these journalists and bloggers to kind of entice them to get uh, interested in the campaign. And then um, this blogger, Roberta Murphy, writes for Luxury Home Digest, is the name of the news, or magazine, online magazine. And so when she gets the coconut, she, she reads that URL, and she hits a custom page that is customized just for her. Right? Uh, and so it has like, hey Roberta, how's it going? We thought you'd be interested in this new resort. Here's some video. Here's like a top ten list of things to do on St. Kitts, because that's where it was. Um, and so um, we made something remarkable. We, we just changed the medium of the message. Instead of an email, we send them a coconut. And we've, uh, it's highly customized, right? It's personalized. It says, the subtext of this message is, we value your, your attention so much we have um, crafted something unusual, and then we have made something customized just for you, right? We haven't sent you a press release. We sent you a coconut with a personalized URL on it, right? Like, if I had more money, I would have, like, burned the URL into the coconut. I don't know how hard that is, but... Um, so, change the media and the message, right? Um, side, this is my second brief diversion. Um, there's this wonderful set of cards created in the 70s by Brian Eno, who was a musician and a, um, I don't know, publisher and a thinker, and they are called oblique strategies, and you can find them online, and they're like brainstorming cards, right? And they're a little bit like, woo, hippy-dippy, but they are superb for brainstorming. So if you're just like trying to think of new remarkables, think of new ideas, often they'll just go find this set of cards or this list of commands, and like one of them might be change the scale, right? So instead of sending one coconut, you send 20 to somebody or something like that. But, um, but oblique strategies, when we're brainstorming, when we're trying to be creative, um, just Google that, you'll find it, it's cool. Um, so that's one way. Say it visually, uh, this is almost rote now, but lots and lots of organizations are doing it, but, and it still works pretty well. Uh, infographics. The web loves infographics. I talked about what the web loves. The web loves infographics. Uh, nonprofits are well positioned to do this because they have lots of facts about their cause, right? Um, and, um, you know, it's easy for somebody to share or talk about um, an infographic because they're not, like, getting behind a brand, they're getting behind a cause. And so, you know, so much of our time is spent uh, crafting our persona, right, our public persona in places like Facebook and Twitter and those places. We're telling stories about ourselves. So uh, when you're supporting a non-profit project, you're saying, I care about this thing, right? I'm a good person. 
And so um, infographics are just like very bite-sized, shareable content. They're not really that remarkable anymore, but we, you can still get good play with them. This is one we did for the Big Wild. It just visualized the um, 20 biggest rivers in the world. Longest, longest? Actually, I think it was most, like most voluminous discharge, actually, is the scientific <laughs> definition, which sounds really gross, doesn't it? So I think we took it off the, yeah, it sounds like a pustule or something. But um, anyway. Um, yeah, so infographics, I think we have another one here. Uh, this told a great story about um, internet traffic in Egypt, right? Internet traffic, internet traffic, and then the day they turned it off, right? That's a super simple one. That doesn't, that's, that doesn't take a sophisticated designer to build that graphic, right? But it tells a very powerful story, and this image was shared again and again and again around the web. Um, so finding ways to say it visually. Um, you can say it visually static like this. I'm now seeing exciting, interesting things about um, dynamic visualization. Um, there's now a, a profession called data journalists, right? New York Times, Guardian are a couple of forerunners in this, which make um, really cool interactive um, experiences around data. A simple one I saw the Vancouver Sun did around the HST recently was that you could um, they had a Google map of all the different districts and they were, the, the map was colored kind of, each district was, if it was really red, they voted no at a high level, and if it was really green, they voted yes at a high level. You can mouse over them, and, you know, it was pretty simple, but it told a story effectively in a way that an article could not. Uh, and those, again, really shareable content. Then riff on what the web loves, right? This is, um, a lot of our projects are this. We see something in sector A, and we say, awesome, how can we twist that and turn it and, and use it here, or the web loves this. I have an obscure example here, but I like it. So who knows Post Secret? Does anybody in the room know Post Secret? Yeah, some people know Post Secret. This is a, a great, I, I usually don't show it in talks because it's inevitably got swearing or nudity at the top of the page, but Post Secret is um, this wonderful project that's several years old now, very simple. People tell their most intimate secrets on postcards anonymously and send, and they like craft the postcards up, they put a bird on it or whatever, and they craft them up and they send them to this guy, they mail them to this guy, and he posts them every like every week. And it's like, you know, I whatever, secretly love my brother. And it's like a beautifully crafted postcard, right? And it's just a bunch of these. And it's super powerful. They've published several books, they have a huge audience. We had a tech client, and they built the most boring thing in the world, intranet software, right? Software that runs your intranet, right? That's, uh, yeah, like who is excited about that? No one. But what we did is we, we made this fake site called Intranet Secrets. And then we had uh, people, uh, we had somebody kind of seed a bunch of postcards, but we invited people to submit their own postcards and say this. Things like, uh, when will my nation's laws permit me to marry our intranet, right? Kind of stupid, but like targeted at 20 or 25,000 IT directors around the country. IT directors who know about Post Secret probably, or even if they're not familiar with it, they get, they get this sense of what it is, right? And then people submit ideas, they tweet ideas at us, we collect all those together. And so, riff on what the web loves. We do this um, all the time. It's like the most reliable thing, because it's, it's uh, less risky in a way. I'll come to you in a second. Um, unless you were just scratching your head. No, you haven't that. Um, it's less risky because you've already demonstrated the web loves A, and we're going to do B that's kind of like A. So B should work okay too. Yes? Um, so the audience of IT directors is very different than people who love to divulge their personal secrets. Yeah. And so I'm curious about the uptake. How do people actually send you postcards versus tw tweeting you? It was mostly tweets, right? Um, though we, had a, we also had an anonymous form where you could just type in your secret, oh, right? Um, I, I, you know, I don't, um, you know, we're talking couple hundred tweets, a few dozen submissions, and maybe two dozen graphical submissions, right? Meaning, like, submitted graphics. Most of the people didn't mail them. They just, like, drew something in Photoshop or something. And, and so, um, for, you know, again, um, the getting submissions was not the objective, right? Getting it talked about and then getting the organization called Thought Farmer, Thought Farmer um, connected to that. Right? And, and because we've done several projects with Thought Farmer, they're now known in the space as like the guys who do crazy marketing projects, right? So people um, may anticipate or recognize or acknowledge or appreciate when they do uh, projects like this. So um, we were happy with the thing, and we had like a backup plan for like, it, what if no one, no one at all tweets or does anything? Because also like most of the tweets weren't funny, right? Like most of the cards we made are funny to this audience. Um, but that's okay, that's acceptable. Um, but our backup plan was to just like, fake some more, right? Like, I don't, I'm, I'm not, I don't feel unethical about doing that. Uh, but we didn't really have to, you know, we had uh, seeded some and sort of thing. And so, 
And there are like nice follow-ons, right? Because for example, um, Thought Farmer still uses a lot of the postcards in their presentations, right? Because they're like funny little jokes and it gives their, their presentations of this thing style or their trade shows or that sort of thing. So it, it has a life beyond its original form. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, slide. Enable creative user contributions, right? And, um, and I, again, I should emphasize these are just four ways that you can make remarkables. There are, I think, dozens of others probably. Um, I say creative. Creative is important here because, you know, anybody can run a photo contest, and photo contests are great. Nothing wrong with photo contests. We do them all the time. Um, but they're really a heartbeat activity, right? Everybody does photo contests. By the way, dogs and children. If you're going to do a photo contest, dogs and children are your sweet spot in terms of uh, greatest user engagement. 